Good evening. Uh, my name is Corrine Shepard, and I'm the current president of the League of Women Voters Bloomington. I want to thank the city of Bloomington. Thank you to our candidates. I'd like to thank our moderator, Bill Johnson. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here this evening. And additional thanks to the City of Bloomington for recording this event so that residents will be able to view the candidate forums through Bloomington TV and YouTube channels. Your civic participation is a critical component in making democracy work, so thanks to all of you. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. The League does not support or oppose political candidates or parties. Our League volunteers, and many of them are here this evening, encourage informed and active participation in government. And now, more than ever, our efforts are really focused on helping people become informed voters. When more people vote, we get a stronger, more representative city and state. So to that end, the League hosts candidate forums like this evening and provides straightforward information about candidates and ballot issues through print and online resources, our website, the Secretary of State website, and including our award-winning one-stop shop for election information called vote411.org. We equip voters with essential information about the election process in our city. The representatives we elect will make critical decisions that affect our daily lives. Elections are our chance to stand up for what matters to us and to have an impact on the issues that affect us and affect our communities, affect our families, and really our future. So a reminder all, to all of you, early voting starts next week, September 23rd. So I'm looking forward to an informative exchange of, of ideas and views at the forum this evening. Um, one thing we have, which is fantastic, we've had a lot of questions from all of you. So our question sorters are doing the best job they can to try and consolidate similar questions um, and I'm not sure we'll be able to get everyone's questions answered tonight, but I want to thank all of you for your active participation in submitting questions to us. So, um, I would like to invite any of you who are interested in joining the League to join our League or another local League. And now I would like to turn the program over to our moderator, Bill Johnson. Good evening. My name is Bill Johnson, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters Plymouth Wyzetta chapter and the moderator for tonight's debate. I have completed all moderator training required by the League of Women Voters Minnesota and have been moderating forums for several years. Before we get started, let's all uh, get out our cell phones and turn them off or put them on silent mode. Thank you very much. The League of Women Voters requested for the safety of the audience and the candidates. Attendees wear masks. Candidates may remove their mask while in front of the camera. The purpose of this evening's forum is to hear the candidates for Minnesota Senate District 50 and Minnesota House District 50B discuss issues that are important to residents of those districts. All candidates for the aforementioned offices whose name will be printed on the ballot have been invited to participate in this, in this forum. A copy of the forum rules was emailed to each candidate. We will try to cover as many questions as possible in the time we have. If your questions are not answered tonight, please feel free to contact the candidates directly. The views expressed in this forum will be those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters. The fact that the League is sponsoring this forum does not imply, dot, does not imply support for any particular candidate. Here are the rules and format for tonight's forum. Speaking order was set out before the forum and will rotate with each question. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement and one minute for closing remarks. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer the, the questions that are asked. League volunteers Nancy Claycomb and Douglas Claycomb will time candidate responses and hold up signs to show the candidates when they have 30 seconds left, 15 seconds left, and then they must stop. The forum will also uh, have one or more lightning rounds, if we can fit it in, where candidates will be requested to answer a question very briefly either one sentence with a yes or no reply. As moderator, I will ask the questions. Legal Women Voters Bloomington determines which questions will be asked and attempts in good faith 
to cover the topics of interest indicated by the questions submitted by Bloomington residents to League of Women Voters via email prior to this evening and by attendees during the event. If you would like to submit a question this evening, please write it on an index card and pass it to one of our volunteers who are collecting those cards. Uh, serving as question facilitators today are Douglas and Nancy Claycomb, members of League of Women Voters Bloomington. All submitted questions become the property of the League of Women Voters Bloomington. No campaign materials, signs, brochures, cards, buttons, or clothing with candidate information are allowed in the Bloomington Civic Plaza. This forum is being video recorded. Candidates, please speak directly into the microphone so that your responses are heard and picked up by the video. When you speak, please look at the audience, not me. Here are the candidates for Minnesota Senate 50 uh, seat, Doug Fulton and Elise Mann. Candidates for the Minnesota House District 50B seat are Beth Beebe and Steve Elkins. Mr. Elkins and his wife Judy are members of the League of Women Voters Bloomington. All right, let's start with the opening statements by candidates. And the first one goes, we'll start with uh, Beth Beebe. to push this on. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for giving us this opportunity to connect with Bloomington voters. I lived in Bloomington for 22 years with my husband, where we've raised our now grown sons. During this time, I've invested myself into helping seniors, immigrants, and disadvantaged families and children to receive resources, transportation, information, and opportunities. You could say that I'm very relational and I do care deeply about the Bloomington community. My background in teaching in Japan, Los Angeles, and Eden Prairie have equipped me to be an advocate for students and families in the Bloomington School Board, where I've been a member for the past five years. I'm on the Legislative Committee advocating for the Bloomington School District and a member of the Delegate Assembly with the Minnesota School Board Association, where we determine which education resolution should be presented at the Capitol. I was asked to run by leaders in Bloomington, including a former Bloomington School Board member, former member of the Minnesota House, and former Commissioner of Education. These leaders know I care deeply about Bloomington, listen to the community, and will work hard for you. That's why I'm listening to you for positive change. And because of what I'm hearing from the Bloomington residents, I am focusing on education. To focus on the basic skills in reading and math and to compensate for the learning loss from the pandemic and the growing mental health needs of the students as well. Also, a stable Minnesota economy to reduce taxes and regulations on businesses so they can invest in development and create more jobs. Also, crime to be sure that there are consequences for violent criminals and justice for victims of crime and incarceration of repeat violent offenders. We need to protect residents from a catch and release program now in place by the current governor administration, appointed judges, attorneys, and prosecutors. All right, thank you, your time is up. All right, we'll next hear from Steve Elkins. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Steve Elkins, uh, your current state representative for Western Bloomington. Uh, and I, I would also like to thank the League for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to address us this evening. My wife, Judy, and I have lived in Bloomington for almost 38 years, and we have very deep roots in the community. Our two grown daughters, Michelle and Danielle, are graduates of the Bloomington school system. Uh, and Judy and I were both very active volunteers while they were uh, attending Hillcrest, Olson, and Jefferson as they were growing up. I have over 25 years of public service to the residents of Bloomington as a planning commissioner, three terms on the Bloomington City Council, two terms as Bloomington's representative on the Metropolitan Council, and I'm now serving in my second term in the Minnesota House of Representatives. I enjoy the endorsement of the entire Bloomington City Council because they know that I have drawn upon this experience to effectively represent the city at the legislature for the last four years. I have a degree in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and moved to Bloomington 30 38 years ago to work as an economist for Republic Airlines in 1984. I spent the last 25 years of my career in information technology, including 10 years in health information technology. In the legislature, I have used my life experiences to good effect as I work to shape policy related to transportation, health care, information technology, and housing affordability. As a legislator, I have been a strong advocate for common sense gun violence reform, reproductive 
freedom, preserving Minnesota's tradition of free and fair elections, state funding for education, including the cost of special education, and well-funded, well-trained uh, professional policing. In my own legislation, I have actively worked to reduce costs and improve access to both health care and housing, address climate change, provide adequate funding for transportation, protect your online data privacy. And during my two terms in the House, I've earned the respect of both colleagues and stakeholders for my thoughtful and pragmatic approach to legislating. I'm known for working on a bipartisan basis. Most of my bills have had Republican authors in the Senate, including six of the nine bills which I managed to pass in a session when little, where little was accomplished. Thank you. All right, we'll now hear from Doug Fulton. <coughs> It is an honor and a privilege to be here with you tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Doug Fulton, and I'm running to be your next state senator representing Bloomington and Edina at the state legislature. My wife, Cindy, and I have been part of this community for over two decades. We've raised our four children here, worshiped here, played here, and invested our lives in this community. This district is home to some of Minnesota's most wonderful resources, schools, hospitals, parks, churches, neighborhoods, and businesses. For decades, our community has benefited from these resources. Our schools have been the strongest schools in the state. Our neighborhoods have been safe and secure. And because of our commercial corridors, we've enjoyed one of the strongest economies in the state. And all of that is at risk today. We are facing one of the highest crime rates in history in our community. Last year, there were 100 murders and 650 carjackings in the city of Minneapolis. Businesses are fleeing downtown and our core urban center is empty. And that crime has pushed into our community. Carjackings, stolen personal property, shootings at the mall, even at hospitals. Our schools are suffering. Scores in reading and math have fallen every year for 10 years, despite spending more money every year on public education. Our younger children are falling further and further behind in basic reading skills. Our government's decision to close public schools during the pandemic has led to mental health issues for many of our children. And inflation is hurting our families. High price in food, gas, and basic needs are impacting our family decisions. You know that. And when you combine high inflation, which is caused by our federal government, with the high tax rates we have in Minnesota, many of our families are wondering, what has happened to our state? So we have to work to repair the damage that policies have done to our state and our communities, and we have to start now. I look forward to this forum tonight and, and uh, discussing ideas. I'm also very happy to welcome Dr. Mann and her family to our community. They just moved here from, where they, from Lake, where they, Lakeville, where they have lived for many years. We think you'll find it a very special place, Dr. Mann. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you to the league again. Uh, I look forward to this conversation. All right. And now, uh, Elise Mann. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to the League, and uh, thank all of you for being here today, taking time out of your day to, to get to know us. My name is Elise Mann. I am an emergency room physician. I practice international medicine, and I have practiced medicine all over the world, which I love to do. I'm the medical director at a facility that treats women with substance use disorders, and I'm a former member of the Minnesota House from 2018 to 2020. I did not run again in 2020. Uh, because COVID-19 came and I went back to the hospital full-time. I felt that was where I was most needed. Several years ago, I also moved back home to Edina, where my family lives. Now, as a physician, I have the privilege of hearing not only the medical concerns, but people's personal stories. And these stories were getting worse. Unaffordable mortgages and rents, rationing medications, taking their medications every other day, turning down medical tests. I started taking care of patients over the phone and I started arguing with insurance companies much more often than I wanted to. And so I, then I went to Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria to provide medical care, and I also provided care at a Syrian refugee camp, and I saw so much suffering that I knew I needed to do more. I knew that if I wanted to take care of people again, if I wanted my patients to take their medications daily without concern of putting food on the table, if I want my three boys to have the world-class education I had growing up in Minnesota, then I was gonna have to do more. And so I'm here today as a member of this community concerned about the well-being of this community and about the state. Uh, and I'm ready, once again, to do more. So I thank you very much for having me here today, and I hope that we can get together and work together um, on needs-based legislation for our communities and not politics-based legislation. Thanks. All right, thank you. All right, now we'll go to the community residence questions. I've got some that are listed as priority, and then I've got some additional ones that have come in. We'll start with the priority questions. And the first question will go first to uh, Ms. Mann, and it is, 
Uh, as a member of the legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence in our elections? Thank you, Bill. So I think we have to start by saying that our elections are very safe. Um, we have very safe elections. We have many checks and balances. We have paper ballots that are checked with, um, with technology. Um, and in the, since the year 2000, in the entire country, there have been 31 cases of actual voter fraud where someone voted twice. So it's, a, it's really a non-issue. We have safe elections. I think what we need to be concerned about is voter suppression, right? We are keeping people of color, we are keeping the elderly, we are keeping people with disabilities from voting with very awful voter suppression laws, uh, such as ID requirements and lessening the number of places to vote, lessening the time window to vote. Um, and so I think that's where we need to focus on, is making sure that as many people who can vote get to the ballots. That is our job. That is our job to defend democracy, and voting is a vital pillar of democracy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, same question to Mr. Elkins. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I agree with uh, with Dr. Mann that uh, we have a long tradition in Minnesota of free and fair and accurately tabulated um, elections. Uh, you know, until this year, no, until 2020, no one ever questioned the integrity of our, our elections. Uh, elections here are free and fair, and we need to keep them that way. Uh, and uh, anyone suggest uh, to the contrary uh, is just you know feeding Donald Trump's big lie. Uh, and do, you know, actively working to undermine the, the public confidence in, in our elections, which are, in fact, free and fair, and we need to keep them that way. Thank you. All right, Ms. Beebe. Thank you for this question, because I have thought about this quite a bit, because I've been an election judge, and I've seen some things that have been um, brought across my way as a head judge and where I've had to make a decision to say, I'm sorry, you don't have the right documentation to be able to vote. Or, no, this is not your precinct. Or, no, it has to be somebody from the place that you are living that can testify that you live there um, because it is a, uh, it was a hotel and it had, we were told by the um, city that it had to be someone from that facility. That was very disheartening, but that was the law. I also know that there have been um, dead people that they've said have voted, and there is documentation for this. There also are felons that have voted, and felons aren't supposed to have that right to vote. They say they will go back and they will um, look at the who's voted and they will make sure everybody is legal and that, but that doesn't seem to be happening because this continues. There's also been ballot harvesting that occurred um, in, um, in District 5 and it was documented as well and there was no consequence for it. We have to use the law and we have to say enough is enough. And also there's not been party balance in Minneapolis and Hennepin County between there being a Republican and a Democrat when absentee ballots are being looked at. We have to enforce the law. Thank you. Mr. Fulton. Thank you. Well, I feel very strongly that um, what a right it is in our country that everyone gets to, to vote. And so we need to make sure that voting is available to everyone. We need to make sure that it's convenient. We need to make sure that there's uh, plenty of time opportunities. And we have to make sure that it's safe and, 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 and accountable back to the system. So, so that said, I think as we look at ways to be able to make sure that we give everyone access to voting, we need to make sure our seniors who are not able necessarily to get to the polls very easy have the ability to uh, vote in advance through, through, through mail-in ballots. And I think other people who have, who have reasons for um, voting um, or early also have that opportunity if they have travel or other issues. But I would say generally speaking, I'm in favor of having everyone go to the polls on the day of election. I would say with respect to um, being able to vote, I think it's crazy not to have someone show an ID, um, a, a voter ID, when they come up to exercise their right to vote. You need an ID to, um, to buy, uh, buy, buy pharmaceutical items. You need an ID to get on an airplane. You, you need an ID to go into some office buildings today post-pandemic. Post so I think it's very fair, and, and if I'm elected, I would push mm -hmm. to make sure that we um, very much uh, reinforce um, IDs in order to exercise your right to vote. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next question will go first to uh, Mr. Elkins, and it is, given the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Roe versus Wade, state legislatures may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. The question is, what measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health? Mr. Elkins. Yes, thank you. So um, the Minnesota Supreme Court has ruled in the case of uh, Doe versus Gomez that the, that people in Minnesota have the right to to an abortion, and that ruling has been strengthened with uh, subsequent rulings recently that uh, you know eliminated some of the uh, roadblocks that have been uh, posed by previous legislatures as well. I fully support the the maintenance of that status quo. I completely are opposed to any erosion of a woman's right to to control her own reproductive health. Uh, I am endorsed by Planned Parenthood Action Fund and Pro-Choice Minnesota, and I, if re-elected, I will pro pro promise to uh, continue to uh, strongly support the, a woman's right to choose. Thank you. All right, now we'll hear from uh, Beth Beebe. Hmm. Well, as um, Representative Elkins has already said, um, in 1995, the Doe versus Gomez case established that abortion is a constitutional right in Minnesota, and that's about as high as it can get, and it cannot be uh, changed at this time, and so I don't think there's a threat to that right, but what I would like to um, focus on more is the fact that Women often turn to abortion because they don't have choices or don't know where to find support for alternatives. And I would work for greater compassionate support for women in a crisis pregnancy. Um, I went through a difficult pregnancy. I was told not to have more children, and I did get pregnant. And it was a challenging pregnancy and recovery, but I have a wonderful son who's getting his master's degree at Montana State University named Ted and I wouldn't trade them for the world. My husband and I have also come alongside many women who upon going through a crisis pregnancy have needed support. We have done childcare, gotten equipment for baby, mm. clothes for mom, and uh, clothes for baby as baby grows and grows into a child. This has been a rewarding time as single moms and their children have become an extension of our family and filled our lives with joy and hope. Thank you. Thank you. All right, same question to Elise Mann. Thank you, Bill. So the legislature should do everything they can to protect women's access to health care. Abortion is necessary health care, period. Um, how do you treat a septic uterus? Abortion. How do you treat an ectopic pregnancy? Abortion. It is a medical procedure. Whenever we limit women's access to care, women die. We know this because we've seen it in countries that have done it. And every time a president in America enacts the global gag rule, which prevents any federally funded facility from speaking about abortion or offering abortion as a service, an estimated one million women die every year. I'm not okay with that. I'm also not okay with saying that women turn to abortion because they have no support or other choices. That's not accurate, right? Women have abortions for 110 different reasons, none of which are anybody's business but their own. And to boil it down to just that makes women sound stupid and ineffective, and that, I'm not okay with that. Um, the other thing you will hear is that because it's codified in the Minnesota Constitution that it's not on the table, it's not up for discussion, that is false. Every single year, Republicans put on the table bills to curtail women's rights, to prevent abortion as soon as humanly possible. And so to say that it is not up for debate and it's not on the ballot this year is absolutely untrue. All right. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. If you are a woman in Minnesota, your right to choose has been protected for 50 years and it will be protected likely for the next 50 years. The right to choose is protected by the Minnesota Constitution and can only be changed with a constitutional amendment voted on by Minnesotans. This legislature will not be voting on that issue. Let me say though, that I am pro-life. As a lifelong Catholic, I am pro-life and I respect the rights of the unborn. I understand that for many women this, and men, this is a deeply personal issue and I respect that. No one wants to find themselves in a position of having to make that choice. Cindy and I have two daughters. Our youngest is adopted from Guatemala, and she's the light of our world today. I'm thankful to God that her mother made one of those choices to give her baby up for adoption 15 years ago. But for anyone to tell you that their top priority is protecting your reproductive rights at the legislature, 
They're trying to change the subject away from other issues that really matter to Minnesota today. How crime, inflation, and failing public schools have put Minnesota in a downward spiral and are impacting our families today. When the legislature convenes next year, those are the issues, as your senator, that I'm going to focus on. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Our next question regards climate, and we'll go first to Beth Beebe. Are there steps that should be taken at the state level to help mitigate climate change and or to adapt to its implications? Please explain. Ms. Beebe. Well, we all have to have common sense solutions to this issue. We all value our planet and we must be good stewards of the future. There must be common sense, well thought out solutions to these energy policies that are being mandated by our governor and how they will impact our lives. He has actually signed on to the California restrictions of not allowing there to be gas powered vehicles sold after 2026. He also has signed on to the California fuel, stand, fuel standards and the California restrictions that cause those fuels to be manufactured in such a way that the price of the fuel will go up. My own um, opponent here wants to raise the gas tax and thinks that the price will go down. And when it does, that that, price, that, that tax should go on there. The people I'm talking to are very concerned about the price of gas. They're concerned that electric vehicles are, are what is going to be the priority. We can see by the debacle in California that you have got to have the right electric grid available and you've got to have enough alternative energy that works. The challenge is we can try some of those things, but we can't depend on one solely. So we have to have diversity in our resources. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Elise Mann. Thank you, Bill. So um, when I was in the legislature in 2018, 2020, I was a founding member of the Climate Action Caucus. Um, and I think we can all start by saying that climate change is real and it's here. Uh, we see this affecting our food, our water, our air, our lifestyles. For example, uh, it affects how infectious diseases travel around the globe. And obviously our weather with you know, um, intensifying weather extremes. There's lots of things we can do. Um, we can work to achieve clean energy uh, by decreasing energy demand for starters. We do this by increasing energy efficiency with investments in technology upgrades and sustainable growth plans. Um, these sustainable growth uh, or expansion strategies provide opportunities for organizations to ensure that the lowest lifetime cost of energy is locked in from the onset rather than it's an afterthought, which we all know is substantially more expensive. Uh, and because we do this, because the cleanest energy is energy that we don't use, right? And we produce and purchase renewable energy, which includes solar and wind. Um, achieving clean energy is challenging. However, every scientist says that we can do it. Um, and it, so it is absolutely achievable. There's already lots of programs in place in Minnesota, like electric school buses, solar and schools, solar gardens. So we are seeing the positive impacts of those things. Even utilities are recognizing that it is not profitable to build fossil fuel infrastructures. Um, Excel had planned to build a natural gas power plant, but decided against it. So there's lots of things we can do, lots of things we are already doing. So I'm proud of that work. Thank you. Same question for Doug Fulton. I grew up in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, a small little town three hours north of here, and it is in the middle of the woods. And my dad, my mom and dad raised eight kids. My dad was a forester. My mom was a teacher. And every year on Mother's Day, my father, my dad would take my mom and my, me and my seven siblings, and we'd go up to Ely. We'd go out in the middle of the woods, and we would plant a thousand white pine trees every Mother's Day. And at the end of that day, we would look back uh, and say, boy, what a great thing that we have done there. Um, if we could only fast forward and do that all the time, what an experience that would be. We all need to be stewards of our, of our, of our climate, and our climate is changing. Um, I am fortunate to, to um, have been all over Minnesota with my kids and my family hunting and fishing and hiking, and we want to make sure that we leave our resources to our kids, the same resources that we have been able to enjoy in Minnesota. But we need to make sure that we're doing it carefully, that we is making uh, policy decisions that we're we're, we're balancing these technological changes and the changes to get to a non-carbon world with the, with the risks that we have in our economy. 
for example, the, the fuel standards that we're trying, as Beth was alluding to, to try and compare ourselves to California and trying to reach a, an electric car only fleet by 2035 just isn't realistic. So we need to be able to manage change to a non-carbon world while we, while we manage the risk to our economy. Um, and we need the marketplace to be the one to help us get there. So um, in, in closing, I'll say in addition to that, we need to be able to do it with partners. We can't go it alone, so we need states and other countries to help us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Steve Elkins. Thank you. Um, like Dr. Mann, I've been a member of the House Climate Caucus myself. Um, I put a lot of time, my own time and energy, into transportation policy, and so my focus uh, has been on the electrification of the of the vehicle fleet. Because right now, in Minnesota, actually nationwide, uh, transportation is the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases. So the transition is going to take a considerable amount of time, but the transition is eventually inevitable. Uh, General Motors even has uh, uh, announced that they are, intend to have their entire fleet for, uh, you know, electric by 2035. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, um, gasoline-powered cars are going away right away. The average age of a car on the road right now is about 12 years, so we're, the electric cars and gasoline-powered cars are going to coexist side by side for a, a very long time, and we need to keep that into a, in mind. And we also have to, um, you know, prepare the uh, our electric grid. Um, our, our sourcing of, of uh, electric, electrical power uh, uh, to be prepared for this transition as it occurs. Uh, it will occur over, you know, 20 years, probably 20, 30 years, but we need to make continuous progress in, 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 this, in this direction. And it will improve, mean, mean, require both imp improvements to the generation capacity, uh, the grid, and uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go out of order here and take a question from the audience, um, and if it'll first go to uh, Elise Mann. How should the state's budget surplus be spent, tax cuts, spending, or budget reserve? Thank you, Bill. So the state released its budget forecast, um, and we have a $9.2 billion surplus for the 2022-2023 biennium, $6.2 billion for 24-25. Uh, that comes down to about 5.2 after inflation is accounted for. So I would take $300 million and uh, fund the expansion of Minnesota Care. That way, every single person in Minnesota has health insurance, uh, access to a health care plan. We currently have about a quarter million people who are uninsured in Minnesota and many, many more who can't access their insurance secondary to co-pays or high deductibles. Um, I would then fund the special education cross-subsidy so that our public schools can use their revenue to fill the other gaps that they have. This would make schools less reliant on property taxes, and we can start closing that achievement gap that is so horrendous in Minnesota. Um, I would also invest money in technology to advance and protect our environment. Uh, the U of M, for example, is making the metals that we need to mine in a lab. That's amazing. We need to invest in those things. And lastly, I would put money back in the pockets of our hardest hit Minnesotans. We like to think that we always know how to spend other people's money, but the truth is that each individual family um, has different needs, and so we need to give them the power to put their money where it is most needed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll hear from Doug Fulton. If Minnesota had lower personal property taxes, we would not be in this situation right now with a huge sur surplus the, uh, that Minnesotans are waiting to see how the governor and next year's legislation will decide to give the money back to the taxpayers. It's, 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 a, it's a crazy situation that we're in. But we do have a surplus. So what to do with it? Our campaign is proposing several things. We've made specific recommendations about using a portion of the surplus to help our school children work through school closing setbacks and to help, uh, in addition to that, to help our law enforcement recruit, train, and get their security back on the street. Those are issues that, are, that face our communities today. Let's take some of that money and put it towards those issues that are one-time cost. Let's use a portion of that money to make long-term tax decreases and get rid of that nasty tax, the Social Security tax. That tax is hurting a lot of people, and it's mostly hurting our seniors. And then finally, let's give the balance of the money back to the taxpayer. The governor can send them a check. We can give people a tax break. It doesn't really matter to me, but it's the people's money. Let's give it back to them. It's a lot of money. And, and let's use some of it to help solve some immediate issues. Let's change the tax so we can avoid this issue in the future. 
and let's give the rest back to the taxpayer. It's their money. It's common sense. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll hear from Steve Elkins. Sure. So towards the end of the legislative session this year, um, the governor, the Senate majority leader, and the Speaker of the House came to a compromise solution uh, under which, um, you know, four, four billion of the estimated 12 billion, uh, including for the next biennium, would have gone uh, to tax reductions, uh, including a complete elimination of the uh, the Social Security ta- tax on Social Security income, would have included uh, significant uh, property tax um, circuit breakers for uh, people facing uh, dramatically increased property taxes, uh, especially for, uh, aimed at uh, seniors on fixed incomes, and would have uh, uh, had also included some across the the, the board income taxes uh, on the on the lower uh, tier rates. Uh, $4 billion would have stayed in the Rady Day Fund, uh, and $4 billion would have been spent, including $900 million to completely eliminate the uh, educational cross-subsidy, uh, would have fully funded uh, special education at, this, at the state level. Um, part of it would have gone, another 8 or $900 million would have gone to improving wages for people in direct care professions, especially people who work in nursing homes or personal care assistants for people who are serving people with disabilities. Uh, uh, where they the the um you we're facing, you know, 50% of the jobs being open, huge turnover. Uh, you, you can't expect people to to care for a disabled person when they can earn more money uh, or flipping burgers at McDonald's. And then we would also have, been, uh, have uh, put a lot of money into uh, buying down um, say, uh, college tuition increases, and I, I supported that compromise. All right, thank you. Beth Beebe. Mm-hmm. Well... As I've talked to the community, the number one thing they want is they want to have more money in their pockets than in the state coffers. Therefore, um, I think it is wise for us to look at how did we get that surplus. Now, another thing that I do want to do with that amount is that for years, decades, my board members will tell you there has been advocation for the special education cross-subsidy to be paid. That is the amount that the government in Minnesota is supposed to pay for special education, but doesn't. And then that comes out of the fund, the general fund, the operating expenses of the school districts. And this has caused difficulty and budget cuts It's time for the state to step up and do what's right for our students, especially our special needs students. The other thing is that um, in higher education, I just learned today that um, the government is supposed to pay for um, two-thirds of the cost of higher education, but instead they are not, and so that needs to be done. I also agree that the Social Security tax needs to be repealed because we have seniors who need a break. And people are leaving, 34,000 people left in the last three years to go to states that are cheaper and don't have such high taxes. And also the fact that um, the property taxes are hurting our seniors, and I know of couples and families that are very much struggling. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next question uh, is with respect to school curriculum, and it'll first go to uh, Beth Beebe. What should be the legislature's role, if any, in determining school curriculum and what is taught in classrooms throughout the state? Ms. Beebe. Well, I think the legislature should actually do the approval. The reason being is that they are elected officials and they represent the people. What's been happening is that there is a curriculum council that has been working on the standards. And although they are working on the standards, they are partisan. They are not bipartisan. They are not elected officials. And this year, for the first time, our social studies um, uh, are being developed, revised by social activists. The first time it's not been educators. We have excellent educators out there who know what is the right thing, and we need to depend on them. But then it needs to be approved by the legislature in such a way that they hear from the community. We need to take that time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Elkins. Uh, I don't think I would leave that to the legislature. (laughs) 
Uh, I, you know, I think this is, uh, we do need, you know, uh, state standards for the, the basics of education. Every, every, every student needs to learn about reading, writing, and arithmetic. I think every student should, by the time they graduate from high school, have some education in civics. They should uh, have a basic grounding in, uh, uh, in financial management for, the, for themselves. Um, but by and large, I think, I think a lot of these decisions are best made by the elected officials on the school board. Uh, and that's that's where I, w I would place most of the responsibility. All right, thank you, Mr. Fulton. You know, Steve, you, we we found an area we can agree on, you know, pretty much. So thank you for helping that. And I, Beth, thank you for the expertise that you brought to the school board in in Bloomington. Um, uh, it's really helpful. You know, I'm really concerned about our students. I'm concerned. Um, certainly about the curriculum, and, and, and Beth addressed some of that. But I'm, you know, today our children are paying a very steep price for the school shutdowns. And whether they're behind academically or whether they're experiencing teacher and, and resource, resource shortages or mental health challenges, we, we have to get our children back on the road to success. So w if you go to our website, FultonForSedent.com, you'll see that we have some specific priorities and programs that we're recommending that we do, that, that we follow in order to try and get those kids back to um, qu quickly regain what was lost. We're recommending using budget surplus funds to develop high impact tutoring for small groups or one-on-one -on -one help for any student that needs it. We need safer schools and grounds with more resource officers in every school, mental health professionals, and social services available to all students and staff on a consistent basis. We need to expand our before and after school learning opportunities and programs and summer school education opportunities. And then lastly, we need to continue to support school choice options for families that are looking for alternative learning faci facilities for their children. If the public school system is not gonna provide us the excellence that we families expect in our public schools, families are gonna look for some other opportunities. Thank you. All right, Elise Mann. Thank you, Bill. So I do think that the legislature has a role, uh, and I agree that they should have some oversight in uh, approving just basic standards. I will also mention that our curriculums are not being written by activists. They are written by educators, um, and that's true across the board. Um, I also think that the school board should have the most oversight uh, you know, uh, as when it comes to their curriculum. And I don't think that we can talk about any of this stuff without talking about the achievement gap in Minnesota because that curriculum speaks very directly to that. We teach two white kids, period, right? So we need to discuss what that curriculum means and what that looks like for the rest of Minnesota. And we need to start early because we, off the bat, we have 35,000 families who don't have access to early education. And we know that that brain development from zero to three is so crucial. So those kids from the start are already behind. Um, and we care because A, these are our community members. Right? We cannot just leave them behind. The groups that are falling behind are some of the fastest growing segments of the population. Uh, we do nothing now and we are gonna suffer the economic consequences of that later. Uh, and happy citizens are free to pursue their dreams. We are robbing these children of the American dream. And given that I am a product of that very same dream, when I came here to this country, I wanna make sure that every single kid in Minnesota has access to that dream as well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, sticking with the subject of uh, schools, uh, the first question will go to Elise Mann. Do you support private school vouchers? Why or why not? Thank you, Bill. No. Um, private school vouchers take money away from public schools. It's that simple. I absolutely um, support people choosing private schools. I support charter schools. I support people having a choice of where to send their kids. I support homeschool. But taking money away from public school to support private schools where there's already tuition paid and you make that choice um, is going to worsen the achievement gap in the state. And it is a model that is used in states that are failing in education. So I do not support that. All right, thank you. Mr. Elkins. Yes, thank you. Uh, I do not support the school vouchers for private schools. Um, I strongly support the forms of school choice that we have, uh, open enrollment, the charter school movement, which was born in Minnesota. And I'm, I've been very strongly supportive of the, uh, um, the, the way that the Bloomington School District in particular has reacted to that. When, uh, when there was a, a, a clamor for more choice within Bloomington 30 years ago, the city uh, uh, allowed a group of progressive teachers to open Hillcrest as a community school. 
uh, and our daughters were among the first cohort uh, in, that uh, reopened Hillcrest as a community quasi-charter ch- school uh, run by a cadre of uh, extremely innovative teachers drawn from around around the district. So I strongly f- support those forms of school choice, but we cannot uh, uh, bleed uh, funding away from our public school system, which is serving us especially well here in Bloomington uh, in order to, to fund uh, private school vouchers. Thank you. All right, Beth Beebe. I think our Bloomington schools are doing a lot of good things, and they have some excellent people who are doing innovative types of things. But I know that my sons actually struggled to get the help that they needed. They didn't fit into a category that allowed them to get learning supports, and they were failing in math, and they were struggling in writing and even reading. My mother-in-law said, I want you to do what you need to do to allow your child to, su- to succeed. And she gave us funding. We were blessed. There are other kids who may not have that opportunity. They may not have a grandmother who gives them the funding that they need. Not every kid succeeds in a public school. As I've been knocking on doors, I'm finding people who have pulled their students out of our Bloomington schools because they have found that it is not meeting their students' needs. That's disconcerting to me. But also I know that we have challenges and we do need the funding within our schools. So vouchers may be seen as taking money away, but you, you have students that are going to private schools And that's not taking money away at this time. It's not diverting funds. And I believe there should be some type of credit that parents get that they can assign to a school of their choice. It's not a voucher, but it's money that has been set aside and should be used by the state for your child's education. And you can have that choice, that freedom. And if the public school serves you well, choose that. All right. If it doesn't, you need an option. Thank you. And Mr. Fulton. I absolutely believe in the voucher system, not because I think it will make a big difference necessarily in, in the number of students that go to public schools, but look, um, it, it is important to all of our communities and our families that we have access to the best education in the world. And I started out my remarks tonight by saying that in, in public education, our schools today um, as hard as our teachers, who we admire and respect, work, and as hard as our families are, um, who, who work to support the schools, our schools are failing. We put more and more money into our, into our schools every year, and for the last 10 years, our schools' scores in reading and, and math have come down, down, down. So something's, something's broken here. What voucher system would allow us to do is create competition. I mean, it's one of the reasons that charter schools, public charter schools started um, when they did. And, and, and today there are 70,000 Minnesotan kids who are in um, public charter schools. There's a lot of kids being taught at home today. And I know that, may, that, that you know many families who know kids that are teaching at home. We've got to create an opportunity to keep pressure on our public schools. We need our schools to be the strongest in the world. They, for many, many years, they've been the strongest in the state. Strong schools are good for families. They're good for our kids. They're good for our future. They're good for our property values. So I'm in support of doing everything we can to make sure our public school is focused on delivering the best outcome. And voucher system would help support that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. To finish up our priority questions, here's a question on housing. And it'll go first to Mr. Elkins. What legislation, I guess, if any, would you propose to assure affordable housing across all municipalities and neighborhoods? Um, Thank you for that question, um, because this has been a particular focus for me. Um, About a year or so ago, the the Star Tribune wrote a full-page expose on exclusionary zoning uh, patterns throughout the uh, the fostering segregated living patterns throughout the uh, the region. And as as I was developing a bill uh, based on my experience as a uh, planning commissioner, city council member, housing and redevelopment agency commissioner, looking at the uh, uh, the the ways that uh, 
um, that, that cities have used to uh, exclude the construction of relatively affordable housing, both uh, owner-occupied, single-family housing, housing of, of, of all forms. And so I've crafted a, a comprehensive uh, bill. Uh, it's one of my nonpartisan bills. Uh, I have uh, my Senate author, is Senator Rich Dreheim. I have uh, partners in uh, Representative uh, Jim Nash, from uh, former mayor of Waconia. This is truly one of the uh, the, the bipartisan initiatives that uh, that I am working with, and I've been you know endorsed by Housing First Minnesota uh, for my efforts. Uh, and uh, uh, so I my approach is to you know enact comprehensive zoning reform that would make it much easier for um, housing developers of all kinds to build uh, relatively more affordable housing throughout the metro region rather than just in the uh, in, in, in accepting uh, communities like Bloomington, which has had long has a, a very progressive uh, housing policy. Thank you. All right, next we'll hear from Beth Beebe. Well, this is really a concern for me because actually what he is proposing is that in suburbs that have um, single-family housing zones, um, that that would be removed. And what has happened in some places already in Minneapolis is that they um, have investors who will purchase up m multiple properties and then put up high-rise apartments on those. And um, what has happened here in Bloomington up at the Pen American was voiced as affordable housing. But affordable housing for who? They found that that is not family affordable housing. And I have had experiences with um, families trying to find housing, even one who their daughter is living with us because they cannot find affordable housing for their family of six children. There are restrictions that are being placed. There are real estate people who are buying up homes and they're making it difficult for these families. It makes me angry because what is being produced and what is being told is affordable housing is basically small apartments. And we have families that need housing of four or more bedrooms or these duplexes that used to be built that had three or more bedrooms and had more living space. That's what we need in Bloomington. That's what we need in Minneapolis and other, other cities. So I do not approve of his proposal. And I am really looking for solutions because I really care about families. And I have been looking since May for a family to find housing. That's how hard it is right now. All right, thank you. And uh, last, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. My professional um, work is in the commercial real estate business. And for a living, I've been for 40 years, I've been helping companies um, negotiate leases and the purchase and sale of commercial buildings all around the U.S. So I work for companies that are based in Minnesota. And we're oftentimes, as we're looking to site a, a, a new warehousing building, a new office building, um, a new commercial uh, R&D building, you know, we're looking for ways to be able to fit into the community to make sure that the jobs, the Centennial Lake office parks, the Normandale Lake office parks, all of the R&D flex office and commercial space that's along Old Shakopee Road in Bloomington, that they all find the right place to be. And I give Bloomington and Edina a lot of credit for taking this housing issue up and being able to take uh, very important housing that's important to our uh, communities to be able to locate them in the right place. And I see that from the perspective of someone who does that professionally. We need to be focused on that. We, we need to make sure we're taking care of that subset of our community that needs lower, um, lower cost housing. And we need to make sure that it's located in the right spot, close to schools, close to, close to transportation sectors, um, close to uh, amenities. Um, and so if I'm, when I'm in the legislature, I'm going to work to make sure that is, if, if we can help support cities with that effort, that we do that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This is a question from the audience. I guess you could say this is a rip from the headlines. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I forget you? Thank you, Bill. <laughs> ah. So um, I think housing obviously is a very uh, important issue. Um, when we look at you know, Maslow's hierarchy of need triangle, at the base of that triangle, we have housing, food, and water. Without that, we can't move up, right? There's no safety, security, mm -hmm. um, and without that, there's no community. So housing is incredibly important. And there's so much that can be done. Um, we can incentivize builders to build lower income 
uh, or more affordable housing. We can have more vigorous city planning for better zoning and looking at that through an environmental justice lens. We can decrease burdensome bureaucracy that is costly but provides very little in safety or other returns. Um, we can work with lending companies to provide more low interest loans and allow for smaller down payments, which is often a very large barrier for families to get their first home. Um, there's currently some bills uh, in the works, including the housing subsidy bill, which would ensure that no Minnesotan is paying more than 30% of their income on housing, which I support that. Um, and lastly, we need to do a better job of preserving the homes that are already there, right? Lots of loans to do that as well are available. So there are a lot that can be, uh, there is a lot that can be done. Um, what we cannot do is have people come into our community and work at jobs, be our janitors, work at McDonald's, and then tell them they can't live here because it's too expensive, right? Because then we're basically telling them that they can come here, serve us, and then leave. And no one was put on this planet to serve us. And so we have to do a better job of incorporating everybody into our community. Thank you, Ms. Mann, and thank you for keeping me honest there. <laughs> All right. This is a question from the audience. It's a good uh, rip from the headlines, as they say. Uh, it'll go first to Beth Beebe. If another state were to send migrants to Minnesota, what would an appropriate response to the Minnesota legislature be? Hmm. I think we want to care for people who are in crisis. But what's happening down at the border is out of control. And it is a problem that is man-made. And it is allowing uh, children to be abused. And it is allowing... Um, the cartels to do drug smuggling. And this is information I get as I do research and I find out what's really happening down there. There are uh, human trafficking rings and I think these are all serious and what we're doing by allowing all of these people to come in is creating more problems. We have to have a compassionate approach. Once they are here, we must show them love and we must care. I've always had a heart for refugees. I've always thought we need to make provision for those that are coming out of very difficult circumstances. So we would have to adjust, and we would have to try to find ways. But I think we could learn some lessons um, from what was done with interim camps, that just putting people all together doesn't solve the problem. They need to be incorporated into the community, and we need to help them. But it's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of wisdom in finding housing. And then in the schools, it's going to tax the schools again because we will need to have services for these students with English language learning. All right. It will cost. All right. Um, and now we'll hear from Elise Mann. Thank you, Bill. So... Um, we do want to take care of people when they are in need, period. There is no but after that. Uh, people immigrate for the most horrendous reasons, right? They leave everything they know. They leave their family, they leave their language, they leave their customs, they leave their comfort foods, everything. They leave their home because it's usually life or death. And so when they get here, we have resources, we have the means. We are not going to, at least I'm not, going to send people away at the door when people are in need. We can invest in, the, in, in immigrants. We can, I, when I was at that Syrian refugee camp in Greece, you guys would not believe the way we treat people. We put immigrants and refugees in cages and we take away their life. We ruin human potential because we are scared because we don't think it's cost effective, whatever the reason is, we ruin human potential. And it is horrific to see that. And so one thing, one very small thing that we can invest in is the legal system, so that when they get here, the transition is faster, we have judges in place to get them moving through. So there's so much that we can do, but we take care of people in need, period. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fulton. Thank you. I agree that we have to have compassion for our immigrants to our country, and we are a compassionate people. Minnesota's a compassionate state. I, I'm, I'm really frustrated with the stories that you see in the newspaper or on the TV at night 
um, with with all of the the um, the mass migration that's coming across our southern borders and the challenges that it's creating for all of the states, and 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 you know and you read about um, the fact that these immigrants are now being um, moved around the country. I, I agree with Dr. Mann. We, we need to be compassionate, and as and if we find ourselves in this situation where we have a large inflow, we need to be able to handle, find the money and resources to be able to take care of that population. But mostly we have got to work within the legal system and with all of our state partners. And we've got to work with the federal government to make sure that we're addressing this issue. I mean, we have to be, we're not a, we are not a country that can continue to have millions and millions and millions of, of immigrants come across the border illegally. We have to have a process. So I agree with Dr. Mann. We have to get a legal process in place to make sure that we're addressing that issue. So let's be compassionate. The compassionate people we are, we are, and um, and look for ways to be able to solve the problem um, uh, on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elkins. Yeah, Miss Minnesota is uh, and its um, social service agencies have always had an exceptional capacity to uh, absorb um, refugees from other countries, whether it was the Hmong coming from Laos, uh, Afghans, Somalis coming from the Horn of Africa, and uh, you know now U- Ukrainians as well. And so we've always had a, a well-developed capacity to absorb immigrants, and we've always been you know very compassionate and accepting of doing it. It's a, a tradition in Minnesota. And I think we're really good at it. And uh, I think that we, we, you know, if that happened to us, um, uh, I think we would absorb those immigrants and uh, make them productive uh, members of, of our, our community, just as we have past waves of, of refugees. All right. Thank you. All right. Next question. I'll go first to uh, Ms. Mann. Would you support legalized sports betting in Minnesota? If not, why? And then the second part of the question, if you do support legalized betting, would you limit it to the purview of the tribal casinos? Ms. Mann. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, this is a very divisive issue, interestingly enough. Um, we've had lots of debates about this in the legislature, and it basically comes down to if we do legalize it, you know, what more can we take away from the indigenous community that we haven't already taken from them? Um, and so if we were to legalize it, I would absolutely make it under the purview of the indigenous community um, and have them take the lead on it. All right, thank you. Mr. Fulton. I, I would, I haven't studied this issue as much as Dr. Mann has, having been in the legislature. Um, but from, from my experience and what I have read about it, it seems to me that that industry is an industry that's been uh, accepted and is working successfully in a lot of states, and um, it's creating a huge tax opportunity. So, you know, there's a marketplace for legalized be- sports betting. Um, I would create opportunities to be able to f- have it happen here, and then I would like to p- I'd like to be part of a conversation, a broader conversation about whether or not that would be run um, in 100% through the Native American. Um, tribal associations. To me, it seems like there ought to be an opportunity for some of these new places where we can um, advance some of these gambling opportunities to raise tax money for Minnesota, that we could do it without having necessarily the tribes be part of every single part of gambling in Minnesota. So I, 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 I absolutely would vote for it, and I would like a robust conversation to try and understand why we can't do more um, legalized gambling outside of the tribal situation. Thank you. All right, Mr. Elkins. Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about this on the House mm-hmm. Commerce Committee this year, this year in which I, I serve. And, uh, you know, the reality is is that uh, sport legal sports betting is occurring on the Internet and in most of the uh, most of the United States right now. It's not a question of whether it's going to happen. It's going to be a, a question of uh, are we well organized to, to uh, regulate it responsibly uh, in, in Minnesota and collect some of the uh, the related revenue. And uh, in Minnesota right now, the, the predominant most of the uh, expertise on how to uh, uh, um, how to operate gambling um, you know um, operations with uh, efficiency and integrity the ad expertise resides in the tribes right now uh, and uh, I support uh, having it done through through the tribes all right thank you Beth Beebe um, at this time I would just encourage it to be done through the uh, tribal groups um, but I have to tell you that 
there are social implications that come with gambling and the impact that that affects families, families whose children come to our schools. And um, through uh, gambling addictions that take away income, that uh, create parents that are investing more in the pleasures of their gambling addiction than taking care of their children. We've heard the stories. And I think that is often neglected. And therefore, I do not support gambling. Um, I think there are so many wonderful things that you can do with your time and your money here in the state. And there, are wiser ways. Oops. there are wiser ways to invest your money in things that will benefit your family than gambling. And um, I just appreciate Minnesota so much, and I think that we want to keep it a place where people thrive and are not burdened or tempted to fall into traps that are set for them. As they call them in, um, in Vegas, they're one-armed bandits, and they do take away your family funds. All right. Thank you. All right. Next question regards firearm safety. And we'll go first to Mr. Elkins. Many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to citizens' need for safer communities? Mr. Elkins. Yeah, thank you. So I am a, an active member along with my wife in Moms Demand Action. I'm a Gun Sense candidate and an Orange Star candidate with Protect Minnesota. I strongly am in, in favor of uh, universal background checks uh, and the red flag laws that would uh, you know, take weapons away from those undergoing mental stress that would uh, place them as a, a danger to themselves and others. And at this point, I am also um, uh, in, in support of uh, regulations that might regulate the sale and display and use of uh, assault weapons as, as, as well. Thank you. All right, Ms. Mann. Thank you. So um, gun violence is a public health crisis. Gun violence is the leading cause of death for children in America. That's crazy. The leading cause of death in America for kids is 100% preventable. So um, the laws as they stand are insufficient. We do have to have background checks. We do need to approve red flag laws. Um, if you have a history of violent behavior, if you have a history of domestic abuse, you shouldn't own a gun. It's, it's very simple. Um, we also know that police support these laws, right? My brother's a police officer. My father-in-law was a Bloomington police officer for many years. I understand that their voices are so important on this topic, and we say that we support the police, then we turn around and say everybody can have a gun, which is exactly what they don't want, right? Um, we all, you also might hear today that we already have background checks, so that's not a non-issue. That's not true, right? Because half of all sales are done at unauthorized locations without a background check. And lastly, some, what, 80% of Minnesotans support common sense gun legislation, so this is an example of government officials not listening to the people and putting lobbyist interest and political ideology above the voice of the people. Thank you. Mr. Fulton. There is a place in Minnesota for, for lawful and responsible gun ownership in Minnesota. I was fortunate to grow up where I grew up in northern Minnesota in a hunting family, and I've hunted and fished in every corner of our state and in many places in the country, including Canada. And I'm proud that my children have a great knowledge and respect for firearms. I cherish our time each fall at deer camp with our family up north, my brothers and my kids. And I'm heartened by the fact that each year hunting and fishing licenses add significant dollars to our conservation dollars that go to help resources for all of our residents. But, I, but it's true. Um, th 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 things are, are not rosy, all rosy. I'm very concerned about the sale of, of eagle, illegal guns in our community. Um, the laws need to be tougher. They need to be more enforceable for straw gun sales, illegal gun sales. And we need to cut off the supply of illegal guns when someone is convicted of using a gun illegally. They should be sent to prison. Um, they should be sent to prison. So I, I do think we can also have a conversation in the state about fire, firearm safety classes. Um, I would recommend that all persons today buying a gun be required to take a, a firearm safety class and that a full background check be done on all buyers. And Dr. Mann, you're right. If a gun is, is, is sold illegally, obviously that person hasn't necessarily had a background check. So we do need to make sure that we are following up on that. At the end of the day, guns don't kill people. People do. So we need to, gun, we need to keep the guns out of the hands of those that should have them and those that are not 
in a mental state to use them. I support the red flag law for that reason. So let's use common sense. Let's keep guns safe and legal and make sure that the wrong people don't get them. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ms. Beebe. Well, I actually have shot guns because that's something that was a skill that I learned at a camp. And it was not anything that was um, illegal. It was a skill that I enjoyed and could do. I know many families in Minnesota have guns and they teach their children to go with them hunting because that is the way that they feed their families. In the city, it seems a bit different. And um, it seems that um, it's important for us to be able to defend ourselves. So I support the right of people to be able to have gun ownership. But I also agree with um, Doug Fulton on his, his um, point about we want there to be responsible gun ownership and lawful gun ownership. And I also support background checks. And um, as Dr. Mann said as, as well about mental health and, you know, if they have a background of violence, if they have a background of, of domestic assault, that's serious and that should be taken into account. Unfortunately, even under the best checks and balances, people still get guns illegally. And then it's the people who have malice in their hearts, who do not respect life, and they're the ones that are taking the lives. That's a very hard thing to change. But it begins in the heart of each person to learn to respect life. And we need to start with that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're getting uh, close to the end here. Um, this may be the next to the last question. Um, I'll give it first to uh, Ms. Beebe. Please explain why you are either a Republican or a Democrat. Ms. Beebe. Hmm. Well, um, I actually am a Republican because I, I find that the values I hold are held more strongly by that party. And the ones held by the Democrat Party do not line up with the principles I live by. And I've also seen some of their policies be destructive to minorities. I've seen them um, hurt minorities. And I have seen them entrap minorities. If you look back on history, you'll find Democrat policies um, created the fact that there are, it had to, to do with welfare that, and it affected my, my parents as well. My mom was in a home where uh, my grandfather was very abusive, and she was, my mo mom's mother was told in order to get help, she would have to divorce um, my mom's dad. And that was not something she could do. And those types of policies started with the Democrat Party, that there couldn't be a man in the house. You couldn't have both, both couples married. Abortion was started by Margaret Sanger. And that was eugenics, to try to get rid of the African-American population, because they were placed in black communities. So the policies of the Democrat Party are not life-giving. And also, um, oh, okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Elkins. Thank you. I'm actually a recovering Republican, but uh, <laughs> I became a Democrat because I believe in fairness and justice uh, and compassion. Uh, and because I, I believe in uh, the integrity of our, our election system, I, um, you know, maintaining democracy, uh, and uh, and just you know, I believe that all people should be treated equally, uh, be be treated fairly, uh, and those are the the core values of the the Democratic Party, and they just don't seem to be core values for the Republican Party anymore. And uh, it's just become the Republican Party. I, I left it 20 years ago just because it had become intolerant uh, and mean-spirited, and I just didn't feel welcome anymore. Thank you. Mr. Fulton. Well, Steve, we welcome you back at any time if you ever you know, decide you want to you know, change your mind about a few of those things. I, I'm, I'm a proud Republican. I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a crazy Republican. I'm, I, I grew up in a family, as I said earlier, a bunch of kids in northern Minnesota. My dad was a, a 
Actually, back then he was one of the few Republicans in northern Minnesota. Um, but my parents taught us the, the, the value of being able to um, set personal goals and achieve them and said, look, if you're going to achieve the goals that you set out to achieve in your life, it's up to you. I mean, you have to, we're going to, we're going to take care of creating an environment where you have the ability to have the, the opportunity to succeed. But look, it's on you to succeed. So I, I took those traits to college with me and the year Ronald Reagan was elected and I became a Reagan Republican. And Ronald Reagan gave our country hope. He was like, look, we, we, we can't be so divisive. Let, let's solve the problems right and left. We are, we, are, we are stronger when we're together. And so let's use all the skills that we have as individuals to come together to make our country great. That's the way that we're going to compete. So I'm a Republican because I believe that the government should do the things it's good to do for us. But, but individuals generally should have the right to follow their own path, have their own values, and find their own success. And, and that's where the Republican Party is today. Thank you. All right, Ms. Mann. Thank you, Bill. So I was never really involved in politics. Um, I had my book, or I had in an anatomy book my entire life, um, learning medicine, which is what I wanted to do since I was 12. But um, when I became involved in politics, it was an easy choice for me which party to go to. Um, because I believe that we, as a whole, are a community, we are a society, and we can't do things individually without affecting other people. And I believe that the Republicans are very much self, me, I, come first, and Democrats have a different view um, in, in the way they shape policy. And so I think as DFLers say, we all do better when we all do better, I really believe that. Um, and I also think the difference is, you know, from what I see, from what I've seen in my experience is that when someone tells you their story and it's something that does not apply to you at all, um, DFLers will generally say, thank you for sharing your story. I don't know what that feels like, but I hear you. And so we're gonna craft policy because you're saying that that is your life experience and that is a big deal. Whereas what I've seen Republicans say is it doesn't apply to me, so it's doesn't exist or it's not real. So then they don't change policy when other people say, this happens to me, this is my life. And so to me, it was a very easy choice. All right, I'm gonna try and sneak in a couple of lightning round questions here before I ask you your final question. Um, please answer yes or no. We'll start with Ms. Mann. Do you support keeping our election day, I guess it's same day registration for voting? No. Mr. Fulton. Yes. Oh, sorry, I get it. I, 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 I know, yes, the, I, my sound was off, yes. <laughs> uh, Ms. Beebe. Yes. Mr. Elkins. I support same-day registration, yes. All right. First one, this one will go to Mr. Elkins. Would you support ranked choice voting for state-level elected offices? Mr. Elkins. Yes, I'm carrying the bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ms. Beebe. No. Uh, Ms. Mann. Yes. Mr. Fulton. No, it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, before we uh, uh, move to your closing statements, I will uh, have one last um, question uh, for each of you. And we'll start with Ms. Beebe. And the question is, what is your favorite snack? Probably barbecued potato chips. <laughs> Ms. Mann. Popsicles. Mr. Fulton. We had two birthdays in our house this week. And, and, and for, for our kids whose birthdays we had, we had a, we had a chocolate uh, Oreo cookie on the bottom, followed by ice cream. It's called an ice cream uh, Oreo uh, birthday cake. That was delicious. That's my favorite. <laughs> Mr. Elkins. You know, I like those uh, lemoncello, uh, um, Scotto uh, lemoncello uh, almond covered things. They're just delicious. You get them at Costco. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to stop at some place on the way home here. Yeah, they're. <laughs> All right. That concludes our uh, a, a, uh, the questions. Uh, and now is the time for the uh, candidates to make their closing remarks. So we'll begin with uh, Elise Mann. Thank you, Bill. Uh, again, thank you to all of you. Thank you to the league. Um, when I was eight years old, we moved to Minnesota. And when we got here from Brazil, a family took us in. And we stayed with this family for several months until we were able to rent a little place of our own. They took me in, my three brothers, and my mom and dad. 
My opportunities, the life that I have today, I owe to my parents for taking a huge leap of faith, but also to that family who lived really close by here. And then 15 years ago, I took an oath to take care of people and to protect my patients. And as I was trying to navigate a system that puts profit over patient care and money over healthcare outcomes, I found that I could not protect my patients anymore. And so I'm here for those two reasons. One is because I believe that all I have, I owe to Minnesota and the people in it. And two is because I still believe in that oath that I took to protect people. And so again, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. And I look forward to working with all of you to legislate policies based on need and not based on politics. Thank you. Mr. Fulton. Thank you for your questions this evening and this opportunity. Conversations about relevant issues are important to, to our state, our communities, and our families. And one of the things that I have sadly come to understand in the last 100 days of talking to people is just how polarizing our politics have made all of us. I hope to bring a fresh perspective to St. Paul, to apply common sense solutions to the problems that plague our community today. Was it common sense to let our police officers vacate and then watch Precinct 3 station burn down in Minneapolis two years ago? Is it common sense for the police to apprehend and arrest street thugs who are breaking into our cars, houses, and stealing property only to have the courts and prosecutors let them on the street the next day? Does it make common sense to keep increasing our taxes like the Democrats wanted to do with the surplus money last session? when Minnesota already has one of the highest tax states in the U.S. Look, I'm not a politician. During my career, I spent my expertise and skills growing families, companies, and leading teams. I plan to bring that common sense mindset to the legislature next year. I thank you for your support, and you can go to FultonForSenate.com to learn more about our campaign. Thank you. All right. Mr. Elkins. Thank you. Um, I want, would once uh, again like to thank the League for providing this opportunity to address you. Um, over the course of our discussion this evening, there are a few things that I think have become abundantly clear. The first of them being the fact that I'm the only one in this particular race who has pledged to unequivocally respect and defend women's reproductive freedom. Second, I am the only candidate in this race that is willing to unequivocally admit that our 2020 elections were conducted fairly and tallied accurately and was pledged to defend our democratic pr tradition of free and fair elections in, in Minnesota. And finally, that I am also apparently the only one in this race who was uh, unequivocally and completely dedicated to funding public education and de devoting all of our, our educational resources to our, our public schools. So if Bloomington uh, voters send me back to the Capitol in November. My commitment to you is that I will continue my track record of re representing Bloomington voters with fidelity in an effective, bipartisan manner that produces results. And for more information about my legislative work, I encourage you to visit my website at elkinsforhouse.com. Thank you. Beth Beebe. Thank you for this night. It's been great to connect with the voters. I want you to know that I am believing that the best thing we can do is to help support our families. A strong family is what is, will make a strong society. We need to support these families. Some have come from difficult circumstances and may not have the parenting tools that they need. I've worked with them. That doesn't mean I'm critical of them. It means I come alongside them. I want to make legislation that helps our communities be stronger, and that starts with the family. I want to make sure they have the funding they need in their pockets and that they are not paying more taxes than they need to. I want to keep our seniors here in Minnesota so that they do not move elsewhere. And I want to make sure that we take care of those that do come in to our communities that have needs. And so I will make sure that we continue to make pathways for them to succeed and especially in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, first, I'd like to uh, give the audience an opportunity to thank the candidates for participating in this forum and for their willingness to participate in the democratic process for run by running for office. Second, thank you to the League of Women Voters Bloomington for sponsoring this forum. It has been video recorded in its entirety and can be viewed unedited on YouTube. What can't you see on YouTube? Links will be posted on the City of Bloomington website and on the LWVB website. It will also be rebroadcast on Bloomington Cable TV until Election Day. 
Thank you to future online and cable TV audience. Remember to vote on or before Tuesday, November 8th for information about registering to vote. Voting early and voting in person, visit the Minnesota Secretary of State's website, www.mnvotes.org. Audience, you are invited to visit informally with the candidates and the league members immediately following this forum. Thank you, and this concludes tonight's forum. Thank you. Thank you.